reviewing this, the 6950 XT, and this one is massive. It's about seven centimeters deep or something like 2.8 inches or so. So this thing is one of the largest video cards that is currently being sold, at least as of today. It's up there with some of the 3090 Ti's and 3090's. And the reason for that is because it is both power hungry and as a result, pretty hot. So this is the refresh of the 6900 XT. It's in the same architecture. It's still on seven nanometer. It's the same die and die size, but it's a little bit faster and the memory especially has gotten a change. Today we're gonna to be benchmarking this at 1200-ish dollars, $1,250 with this model. Uh, versus some of the other cards on the market. Before that, this video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is a Linux server hosting provider that GN has used for nearly a decade now for its own servers. Alongside dedicated website hosting, Linode makes it easy to cut out third-party VPN services to build your own VPN that you fully control, easily configured via the interface. Linode also has hundreds of guides for custom servers, including game server apps like Rust, Minecraft, CSGO, and guides to host your own video calling servers to eliminate third parties. Linode is a great way to take back control of software and your hosting, and Gamers Nexus viewers get a $100 credit for 60 days on new accounts at linode.com slash gamersnexus, or click the link below. Okay, so this particular one is the Sapphire Nitro Plus Pure, and we're going to be doing a teardown of this separately, so if you want more details on this specific card and how it's constructed, definitely we'd recommend you checking that out. Uh, ultimately, this is a 6950 XT GPU. AMD, of course, supplies the GPU and the memory. The memory is 18 gigabits per second, up from 16 on the previous 6000 series cards. So that's the refresh here. Clocks get boosted a little bit as well. There's some other changes we'll go over too. But for the card itself, this particular one is a three fan design. It's running three axial fans, and it has three VBIOS switch positions. Two of them our physical VBIOS is on the board, and then one of them is controlled through software. This is something Sapphire does. The most immediate thing to point out is that this card has three PCIe power connectors. So it's got two eight pins and one six pin. That should be a pretty good indicator as to the power consumption of the card itself. Now for pricing, so there's three cards that AMD is pushing out today officially. We are only reviewing this one right now. They are the 6950 XT, MSRP is $1,100 for that. This model again is $1,250. There's the 6750 XT, that's at $550. And then the 6650 XT, which is a $400 card. Now, if some of you haven't checked in a while, it's worth looking at GPUs that are in stock near you now because uh, we just checked before this review. We were able to uh, find 3080s in stock on Newegg and Amazon, for example. The pricing for the cheapest one we found there, sold and shipped by Newegg, it's a step above the third party marketplace at least, uh, that was $900, the cheapest one we could find at the time of writing and filming this. So they're available, they're close to where they launched, which isn't bad, certainly a lot lower than it was over the last year or so. The 6900 XT we found in stock for about $1,000, that is in fact the price that it launched at. And the 6800 XT we found in stock for $800 to $900, a little on the high side uh, at the $900 mark, but much better than before. The reason for mentioning this is because now, finally, the argument is going back on the consumer side of things. So instead of a card launching and us kind of going, the value is not good, but what are you gonna do? Buy something else? Ha, fools. Now we can say, actually you can buy something else. So finally, it's, it's looking good for consumers again, at least a little bit initially. It's starting to get there. Uh, so as you watch the review and the benchmarks, just know that there are actually other cards you can buy, at least at the time we checked when filming. Let's go through some specs here. So 6950 XT versus the 6900 XT, they are basically the same. They're both 520 millimeter square die sizes. It's the same die. They are both seven nanometer process node. Uh, both ADCUs are compute units and therefore both 5120 stream processors. They both have 80 ray tracing accelerators. They both have 128 ROPS. The cache is the same capacity at 128 megabytes. The memory is the same capacity at 16 gigabytes. So then the actual differences come down to memory bandwidth, for example. There are two memory bandwidth numbers. There's effective and actual. The one we're going to talk about is actual. Actual raw memory bandwidth on the 6950 XT. 576 gigabytes per second versus the 6900 XT was lower than that at 512 gigabytes per second. That's the difference of 18 versus 16 gigabit per second memory. Now, AMD also made changes with the infinity cache speed from what they were telling us, and that helps with the effective bandwidth. So that's where you'll see some of the gains made in this GPU that might not otherwise be expected since it's the same CU count 
and SP count. Additionally, of course, frequencies are different on this uh, for bass and boost frequencies. So that's the card we're looking at. Let's get started. We'll look at the frequency thermals and power numbers first. Power's high, and then we'll go from there. We'll start with the wide range of power consumption. So tested at the PCIe cables and the PCIe slot combined, not testing system power, the 6950 XT pulled 377 watts when on the stock V BIOS. That puts it as 77 watts higher than the original 6900 XT, or about a 26% increase of power consumption. The RTX 3090 FTW3 pulled about 385 watts, just for reference, with the 3090 Ti pulling 500 watts under normal conditions. The 6950 XT with its OCV BIOS ran at 411 watts without any other changes, allowing 9% overhead for additional boosting. Overclocking on either V BIOS pushed it to about 507 watts, that's a 35% increase over the stock test, and they both cap out at about the same place. The overclocked 3090 Ti FTW3 is the only card that ran higher power consumption than these results at 522 watts. We're definitely in NVIDIA Fermi territory or AMD Hawaii territory with GPUs now, and the solution seems to be mega heat sinks that are three or four slots wide. Not something they tried quite as much, or as confidently back in the day, but with SLI and Crossfire basically dead, now they've got the room to do it. Thermals start out sort of rough. The average GPU temperature was okay at about 76 degrees Celsius, but the hotspot temperature jumps to about 95. That's for an expensive, large add-in board partner card. TJ Max on these cards, or the Thermal Junction Max, is about 110 degrees Celsius, so it's technically within spec, but adding a higher ambient temperature, poorly cooled cases, higher effective ambient, it'll make it a closer call for these big cards, uh, or they'll have to run at much higher fan RPM. Not to mention that this is just the stock V BIOS anyway. As for how the fan responds to that, it's plotted on the right axis. Hysteresis is odd on the V BIOS programming for this one, as is overall fan behavior. It ramps hard to 1500 RPM on immediate load, holds for about a minute, and then it dies. The fan falls to about 1100 to 1200 RPM at this point, allowing the large spike that we're seeing in thermals. That's with the stock V BIOS switch. Frequency testing for the 6950 XT puts it at about 2450 MHz during the same 3D Mark workload as before. The frequency mostly sustains with a slight reduction throughout the test from heat buildup. And the secondary V BIOS was almost identical to the stock V BIOS. Overall, Sapphire should definitely be running a more aggressive fan curve on this, but they're trying not to make the thing too loud. Total War Three Kingdoms is our severe stress test. We set graphics to Ultra, which allows a wider detection of performance scaling at lower resolutions. Starting at 4K, the 6950 XT ran at 50 FPS average, which has it near the 3080 Ti and 5% ahead of the overclocked and undervolted 6900 XT, or 10% ahead of the stock 6900 XT. The 3090 Ti leads by 20%, but it's about 100% more money, so definitely not a lead to boast about. Compared to more normal cards, for people who don't laugh like this, <laughs> The 6950 XT is about 5% ahead of the RTX 3080, or 14% of the RX 6800 XT, and these are far cheaper if you can find them. And on that point too, the market has been improving, so if you haven't looked in a while, you should take a look. At 1440p, we still have room to see scaling. The 6950 XT ran at 106 FPS average, with lows proportionate to that average. This has it above the 3080 Ti, but only by about 2.6%, so that's a technical lead meaning it shows up in testing, but it's not a meaningful lead. You're never going to notice that. The 3090 non-TI leads by another technical but irrelevant lead, with the 3090 Ti leading by a more noteworthy 10%. The 3090 Ti overclock shows that we're still within CPU performance and bound by the GPU, which is good for reviewing these. Let's look at this another way. The RTX 3080 achieves 89% of the 6950 XT's performance, and that's at 85% of its power consumption. It's a pretty close one-to-one -one ratio there. The RX 6800 XT, meanwhile, holds about 88% of the 6950 XT's performance, and that's at about 78% of its power consumption. So these higher-end cards, not surprisingly, are less efficient in terms of performance per watt. At 1080p, we still have room to see GPU scaling, which is great, because for AMD, this is a benefit. AMD's current RDNA architecture runs disproportionately well at lower resolutions while NVIDIA's Ampere runs disproportionately well at higher resolutions. We typically see AMD and NVIDIA trade at 1080p and at 4K. The 6950XT holds 161 FPS average here, now pushing it to a tie with the 3090 Ti in 
sorry, 3090 Ti in lows and average FPS alike. The 6950 XT is about 10% ahead of the 6900 XT once again. At 4K and high settings, Shadow of the Tomb Raider ran at 112 FPS average on the 6950 XT, placing it ahead of the original 6900 XT by 14%. The RTX 3090 Ti FTW3 and the RTX 3090 non-Ti on OCV BIOS flank the 6950 XT. The 3090 Ti FTW3 technically leads at 6.2% ahead in average FPS with the lowest proportionally ahead. Given that the 6950 XT Nitro is $1,250 or so and the 3090 Ti FTW3 is $2,200, overall we'd say the 6950 XT in a vacuum only between these two is better value than the 3090 Ti FTW3 here. Both, however, are bad value when compared to an RTX 3080, an RX 6800 XT, or even a 3080 Ti, which we weren't that fond of for value to begin with. It's normal that Halo products have the worst value, of course, since they're targeting a different kind of buyer, but there is a cutoff that we think exits being acceptable. At 1440p, we're CPU bound and can't see any meaningful difference. It's a good thing we had the Total War results previously though, because that did show a difference. The 6950 XE and the 3090 Ti are about the same here, so we'll skip 1080p for Tomb Raider since it'll just be bound anyway. Red Dead Redemption 2 comes in both DirectX 12 and Vulkan APIs, so we tested both. The Vulkan results are very interesting. We have a little more limited data here because we don't test it as often, but at 1080p, Vulkan still shows scaling in Red Dead 2 by removing most of the bottlenecking from the CPU. The 6950 XT runs at 175 FPS average with lows pacing behind. There are no frame time pacing issues here. The lead over the 6900 XT is 3.6%, with the lead over the RTX 3090 about 11%. You can see that NVIDIA cards are all limited on about 150 to 157 FPS average for the wall, as they're all bouncing off of a driver limitation at 1080p on the CPU, not just GPU limitations. That is, however, still a part of the GPU product you buy, so it's still a relevant difference. The AMD GPUs are able to circumvent this and run less limited, still showing scale. We can't see the differences between the NVIDIA GPUs really at the top end since they're all restricted, so you can ignore the dragging performance of some of these cards as opposed to some technically lower end models. At 1440p, the 6950 XT leads the chart with a 3.7% gain on the 3090 Ti FTW3. The lead over the 6900 XT is about 10%, aligning with previous results and contributing to the same average overall uplift. At 4K, we see the Ampere architectural advantage coming into play. The RX 6950 XT is now bested by the 3080 Ti, the 3090, and 3090 Ti, leading only the 3080 and down. This is consistent with previous research we've done, showing an overall advantage for NVIDIA at 4K and for AMD at 1080p or 1440. Next is DX12, we'll keep this short. At 4K and DX12, the 6950 XT ran at about 96 FPS average. That has the 3090 Ti about 11% ahead of the 6950 XT, with the 6950 about equal with the 3090, including in lows, and about 11% ahead of the 3080. Compared to the 6900 XT, the lead is closer to 15%. At 1440p, the 6950 XT and 3090 Ti OC are both pushing the limits of the benchmark and are functionally tied. The lead over the original 6900 XT is about 7% here, with the lead over the 6800 XT at 7.5%, and then it's 19% over the 3080. Horizon Zero Dawn has good scaling as well. At 4K, the 6950 XT ran at 91 FPS average. That puts it about tied with the RTX 3080 Ti, leading the 6900 XT by a relatively meaningless 3.2%. The 3090 pulls ahead by 9% here, with the 3090 Ti jaunting 14% ahead. The 6950 XT isn't meaningfully different in performance than, say, a 3080 or a 6900 XT, but the cost is definitely meaningfully higher. At 1440, the 6950 XT pulls further ahead as compared to its 4K performance, and these advantage is shining through here at this lower resolution, and the 6900 XT shows this as well, where it pulls ahead of a 3080 Ti. In fact, the 6800 XT also pulls ahead of its competing 3080. So overall, AMD's performance has improved relative to NVIDIA's when looking at 1440. But again, that's old news by now. It's still being reiterated by the 6950 XT though. At 1080p, the 6950 XT leads the chart as NVIDIA gets bound up at around 170 FPS average. That's a lot of money to pay for 1080p gaming though. We'd expect most users would be on higher resolution monitors here. In Rainbow Six Siege at 4K, the 6950 XT ran at 196 FPS average, planting between the 3080 and the 3080 Ti. 
This has it 16% ahead of the 6900 XT, and it allows the 3090 a lead of about 6%, so not that exciting overall. At 1440p, the 6950 XT ends up at 8% ahead of the RTX 3090 that we recently retested, just below the 3090 Ti, and more meaningfully leading the 3080 Ti and the 6800 XT than in some previous games. It's scaling better at 1440p. So that's it for the benchmarks for the 6950 XT. Just strictly speaking to what Sapphire has built here, the card itself looks very nice. We don't normally talk too much about looks, but they have actually done a really good job with the uh, color matching. Typically when you do different colors across different materials like metal and plastic, it's tough to get things to match and look right. You'll normally have one that's a little bit off. They've done well there. The construction feels pretty good. We'll see how it is actually in the teardown. The thermals certainly are on the higher side. How much of that is on AMD, meaning how much of it is what else, what options do you really have other than liquid uh, versus on Sapphire will also be revealed in the teardown. They don't have a ton of plastic blocking the exhaust. It's a little bit, but it's nothing like the thick series of XFX cards. That was the actual name. And uh, overall, the construction of the Sapphire card is good. That does not change the fact that the GPU from AMD is exceptionally expensive. It is not as much of a step up in price as, say, a 3090. So the 3090, you know, the place where those get defensible pretty much only is not in gaming, really, obviously, same for the TI, but rather in certain production workloads where you just need a ton of VRAM, but you don't want to go quadro for one of the many reasons you wouldn't go quadro. We use 3090s in one of our editing machines because they work the best for what we do. Andrew does a lot with Unreal Engine and Blender and uses the VRAM in that, and we find that it works a little bit better with Premiere than some of the quadro cards we've worked with. Uh, on the driver level, that is. So that's sort of the defense for a 3090. For gaming, our recommendation is still don't buy it. It's way too much extra money for not that much extra performance for the vast majority of people. And the same is true for the 6950 XT. This thing is so massive. Every time, every time I pick it up, it's like, that's heavier than I thought it would be. Uh, the 6900 XT, we said the same thing. We're like, the 6800 XT, far better value. You get the vast majority, overwhelming majority of the performance, like close to 90% for a much lower price. And the same remains true here. So uh, the conclusion then is you should check out GPU prices for your region. We're seeing they're starting to come back into where they should be, closer to it. And that means you have options. That means that you don't have to just refresh the page when a card launches and hope to get one because it's the only thing you can get. And that starts to take away some of the argument for this particular card and the 3090 Ti and others that NVIDIA has launched recently as well. So if you can get it close to $800 to $900, a 3080, a 6800 XT, they get you about 90%, sometimes plus, of the performance of this thing, and they are cheaper by upwards of $400 plus, depending on which cards, which models you're looking at. $400, you will absolutely notice that money. You can keep the money, you can put it into other parts of the build, you can improve the CPU, the memory, the cooling, any number of things. But putting it towards GPU, unless you are doing specific production workloads with, say, like a 3090, where you need the memory capacity, except for in that scenario, putting it towards a GPU, you're probably not going to really notice the frame rate change, realistically speaking. Some FPS snobs, maybe you can convince yourself, you can rationalize that you'll see it. Uh, ultra competitive types, maybe. But for the most part, we just think that it's, it's a bit extra money for a lot of extra money for not that much performance. And um, that's sort of the end of the review here. It's like a lot of the others, except with a, one really defining point this time that we haven't had recently, which is that there are other cards in stock, at least when we wrote this. Hopefully that's still true when the video goes up. Um, and so we feel a little more optimistic now. It's been I mean, really kind of like downtrodden reviewing GPUs over the last year or so because we knew the market and it's hard to keep saying the value is bad, the value is bad, value is bad, because what are you going to do? But anyway, it's looking better. Hopefully it sustains even if they go out of stock. It, it, from reports we've been seeing around the web, it looks like it has improved overall. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, check back for the teardown. The card itself, uh, Sapphire's credit here, is actually a really nicely designed card from everything we've seen so far. And uh, we're excited to take it apart. So subscribe for that. Go to store.cameronsaccess.net to grab one of our teardown toolkits, mouse pads, or mouse mats, mod mats, other things like that, and help us out as well. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get some extra videos. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.